From an undisclosable location, for reasons of security and therefore ever-escalating insecurity, this is the mothership. That is, Coast to Coast AM, come at the hour, come at the mothership. And boy, this baby handles real good. I just took a pass by Guantanamo a minute ago and uh, ran into a couple of uh, raptors. Passed them like they were tied to a post. And I'm sure that our guest tonight, John Lear, would appreciate that. He's blown past a bunch of stuff like it was tied to a post. John Lear, I've been looking forward to talking with him for a long time. Howard Hughes has always been one of my heroes, but I'll tell you, if there was ever a replacement, it just might be John Lear. We're going to talk about all kinds of stuff tonight. And I must say, I must say that there's enough going on in the world right now (laughs) to absolutely make you walk on the side of your head just almost permanently. Uh, For the first hour, I would like to to hear from you. Uh, We would like to do some open lines with you and just hear what's uh, what's on your mind, what's going on. Uh, Hopefully... (laughs) We, we may not hear from the guy who called one night and went, I got grabbed, man. To which I responded, what exactly do you mean by that? I got grabbed, and it's not fun, so I didn't pursue it. But um, hopefully he has not been grabbed in the middle of the night anymore. But uh, anyway, anything that's on your mind, uh, anything you want to get into a little bit on the one program that will discuss things that's just not going to happen over the mainstream media, I I, I like them. Personally, but I don't understand why some of the things that are happening in the world are not being discussed on the mainstream media. And, and I'll tell you, well, there are several little sites that I like to go to. I always like to go to Alex Jones' InfoWars. I like to go to Full Spectrum Dominance. That's a good one. And uh, several others. Drudge Report also. But over the last, uh, oh, 48 hours, it's been everything from Taliban in drag. yes. We are the angels, okay? The feds find a man for taking a group of people on a Bigfoot hunt without a permit. (laughs) The Dallas Federal Reserve says uh, bailing out the big boys is just killing the economy, just a scathing, radical indictment of the nation's financial system. 450 million rounds of forty caliber, that's 10 millimeter short. Forty caliber Smith, uh, Smith & Wesson is the... Caliber. Smith developed it. Hollow points. Been ordered by the Department of Homeland Security. 450 million rounds. And uh, word is there's 170 million rounds of .223 that's been ordered by that outfit also. I wonder why they need that much ammunition. Captain George Noria had Linda Moulton Howe on Thursday night. And she was talking about um, a lot of disturbing things, the uh, the ever escalating, the ever escalating. Way, I mean, what? <clears throat> well, don't you just have to wonder what are we in such a big hurry for? It seems like all of this is just getting quicker. Let me give you, let me give you a little idea here. This this got my attention big time. A patent has been awarded for a behavioral behavioral recognition surveillance software system. The American surveillance state is becoming increasingly advanced, expansive, and capable of processing huge amounts of data at blinding speeds. Now, Behavioral Recognition Systems, Inc., also known as BRS Labs, has developed an artificial intelligence-based system which supposedly can automatically recognize, automatically recognize human behavior. Technology which seems similar on the surface already exists and is being used on surveillance platforms like the IntelliStreet's Streetlights. These streetlights are outfitted with a, a great deal of surveillance equipment. They're reportedly capable of monitoring activity and telling the difference between certain behaviors while also being able to tell the difference between humans and animals. <clears throat> this does not bode well for us. So I have a question for you. Did anybody hear about the uh, gigantic arms uh, seizure down on the Arizona-Mexican border? It's within the last few days. All kinds of stuff. And there were a lot of um, inscriptions on the various grenades, grenade launchers, and uh, semi-heavy weapons. Uh, According to the report that I read, there's nothing crew served there. These are, but, you know, you don't need a crew for a lot of stuff to cause a lot of problems. A lot of Arabic writing on them, stuff like that. There seems to be a, um, a Hezbollah presence that's being utterly and completely ignored. Throw into the mix, the Sheriff Arpaio is uh, claiming that this is a really, really bad 
uh, fake job on our um, chief executive's bona fides. It's absolutely unbelievable. More gun laws in the wake of Trayvon Martin's case. A lot of people trying to use that tragedy to their uh, to their own advantage. I'm talking to you, Sharpton. And this will grab you, maybe. This will grab you in the middle of the night. The FDA has deleted one million signatures for the GMO labeling campaign. David Icke says this is not a bloody game. And he's bloody well right. And just in case you want to know, there's been a 17 trillion dollar hole found in Obamacare. The Supreme Court is working on their decision now. It's quite interesting to listen to that little deal. You know, I can't think of anything more paranormal than what's going on in this in this world and specifically in, in our country. Thanks very much, everybody, for uh, joining us for the uh, little live chat that I uh, was privileged to be a part of on Wednesday night. I hope we can do that again. And in the meantime, if you have something on your minds, I wish you would like get it ready for us because we would like to hear from you. All of us would like to hear from you. Now, i got to tell you this. As I told you, I'm a told you, and I'm a told you. And many of you listened, but some of you did not listen to me. California slammed with Fukushima radiation. Here it comes. Oh, yeah, it's radiation. Here, here we go. Don't touch the dial. It may be radioactive. The Journal Environmental Science and Technology reports in a new study that the Fukushima radiation plume contacted North America at California, quote, with greatest exposure in central and southern California, and that southern California's seaweed tested over 500% higher for radioactive iodine-131 than anywhere else in the U.S. and Canada. Projected paths of the radioactive atmospheric plume emanating from the Fukushima reactors, best described as airborne particles or aerosols. Blah, blah, blah. Once more, all right, subsequent atmospheric monitoring showing it was coming in contact with the North American continent at California. And so, when you go to the Coast website, you're going to see many things. What is he talking about? Well, for example, we have on the um, the highlights carousel, John Lear's moon anomaly images. Wait till we get into this. If you haven't heard John Lear speak on these matters, you're in for a real treat tonight. Disturbing and wonderful at the same time. There's a video on the uh, Coast website of Jupiter's UFO. And... Um, there's Where Has Everyone Gone? You'll see. Coast to Coast AM dot com. And uh, in the news, new images of Titanic shipwreck revealed. Navy says we're four years away from laser guns on ships. Exploding dinosaur myth burst by scientists. Imaginary monsters of U.S. cities and crowds flock to French town for UFO rescue. When you get finished with that, click on the host button. Names will drop down. Click on mine, go to the bottom of the uh, extraordinarily long write-up. I'll edit it when I get around to it. There's too much on there. And click on that link down at the bottom. Pay that link a visit. It might help you. All right, we'll be back with some of your calls. And if no one calls, I'll read the phone book. Just kidding. Just kidding. I will not read the phone book. And if I do, it'll only be numbers. All right? Mount up. The Caravan to Midnight leaves in two minutes on Coast to Coast AM. Okay, welcome on to the bridge, everybody. Let's talk to uh, Jack in Michigan on Wild One. Jack, come up to the bridge and talk to us. Jack, are you there? I'm not hearing Jack. In fact, I don't hear a thing. Well, all right, then let's go to Marcus in Ontario, California. Marcus, are you there on Wild 2? What's going on, dude? Good to no, hear just, you. Just hanging in there, man, out on the clothesline, and it's raining. Yeah. Listen, I've been <laughs> studying uh, enough to blow your mind about what's going on with the solar cycle. There's not yeah. a lot of the right chatting, let's call it. it seems well, tell us about it, man. Kind of what you got? Seared off into the, the forest without the trees to see. I was wondering, maybe I'll give you an option of where you want to take this. Would you like 
a better answer on what the end of the mind calendar means? Absolutely, would positively, you, I would. Would you like to know what this rumbling in the earth has to do with the sun and the yes. planet and how they're configured in this fancy academic term called heliogeocoupling? You know I want to hear about this, and you know... The, our, Hold on, I'm going to keep teasing you for a sec. Hold on. <laughs> Would you like to know how the cells in your body transmute via pineal gland hormone neurotransmitted production via the Schumann resonance, via the sun, via the cycles that the mind's seemingly had a pretty good handle on. Not that anyone's talking about these cycles in the exact vernacular that we need to be discussing them in, but I'm kind of leading us down the alleyway, if you will. Yeah. Take it let's where you it. want. No, let's, uh, you just start wherever you want to. This all sound, sounds very interesting. Well, now, First of all, before great. you begin, let me ask you this yeah. now. How did you come by this information? <laughs> well, there's a lot that uh, you've never heard about because... There's only a handful of geeks that are brave enough to weather the storm in the back of the libraries and to use their student accounts to uh, search for things that may or may not get them an A on the next exam. But these are academic reports in part. These are translations in part. I mean, the academic uh, vaults are very deep. Most people will never, ever truly go to the uh, necessary level. Okay, let's hear some of it, brother. Well, there are various solar physics journals that will discuss things that they just don't catch. The, they don't have the tread, if you will, to get into the type of discussion that we need. But there's so much floating around. I'd like you to take it somewhere. But I would tell you that the, the end of the calendar is a specious event to push it towards a window of December 21st, 2012. It take me a little bit of blackboard space to fill that out with you, but the more important thing for us to remind ourselves of, because we will be dropping through a few more dates as the solar cycle picks up, it's important to remember each window that happens with the sun, and I'm going to drop you some predictive windows for just the Coast to Coast listeners tonight on Excellent. how this works, but there is a solar algorithm and I'm going to be dropping not so much of the science behind it, because that would take too long, but the actual windows to look out for. My last window that I predicted was March 10th, and we saw some pretty interesting stuff hitting the fan. Yes, we did. Right around that time. I was pretty surprised myself, but it looks like I keyed this one in the right way. And so what we're going to see in a sort of 41-day interval is uh, a type of, and this has been discussed by a solar physicist named Bauer. They're talking about lower than 11-year periodicities. Not a lot of the solar physicists really care about less than 11-year cycles. I don't know why. Don't ask me. But these are important because they're actually going to start to track out a map, if you will, about how we as a society, well, we can either get really worked up about it and harden our infrastructure and get all kinds of sophisticated tech to protect our gear because there will be increasing surges on electronic fronts. We should be aware of this. I talked to a radio host here locally on B101, and he was talking about, get this, he's talking about his microwave zapping food, and he had no idea what was going on. We were in the middle of a huge solar storm. And, I mean, this is obviously not that important, but just to give you an idea, there's going to be implications. Here at my house, we experienced a huge rumbling at 1230 in the morning, and my wife and my kids, they all woke up, they felt it. It's real stuff. There is effects that we don't understand because we don't understand how gravity and electromagnetism works in the inner mantle because we don't even really have a good handle on the inner mantle. You know what I'm saying? That's absolutely true. Nobody, nobody has been able to explain gravity yet. Right. So key words here for those who are interested. There is something called eutectic forces, which have to do with some sophisticated stuff. We're not going to get into it, but yeah, I want to get right back to where we're sort of going towards. There's a few dates. Do you mind if I drop a few dates down on your head? No, let's go. Well, we just patched Mar 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 March 10th of 2012. I can actually tie these all the way back to the previous March 9th, which we saw, I got my data here, largest CME since 2005. March 9th was an X1.5. What did we see 
right around the corner. How long does it take from energy to get from here to the sun and then for the earth to do a little effect? We saw the tsunami effect. Okay, let's let's just these are all tied together, okay? So it's important. We can go backward and forward in time, and I can verify data that's available on spaceweather.com, USGS, blah, blah, blah. Let's go forward. March 10th, go forward this little time span I'm talking about. These are referred to more technically as multi-cycles, as per Bauer and solar physics journals. Next day, we're looking at is April 20th. I don't see that being active because it looks like from my data that we go two on and one off. Well, we've just had two on, which was January 27th by my calculations, which we had an X flare. Then we went to March 10th. Then we're going to probably have one off April 20th. Then we'll get back on for May 31st, July 11th. And those are where we're going to start to see by my predictive system here, which ties into the Mayan system, which would be far too long to discuss, how we're going to get into this. Now, let me tweak you out, brother. The Mayans knew this to the degree that they were understanding, because they, they didn't have names for pineal gland, but they knew in their consciousness something was affecting it. They mapped, they mapped it out without satellites, without algorithms, without computers, and they did a pretty damn good job. Why? Because they were hell-bent on maximizing, milking, utilizing this solar energy to go where no man had gone before. And it wasn't through a spaceship. It was through consciousness. They didn't care about technology like we do. They weren't caught up in the forest of the trees. They were all about consciousness. They were hell-bent on it. So they wanted to know, hey, man, when's the next time we can do this? This was fun. Okay? So it's not all about doom and gloom. You might lose a couple hard drives. That's not the end of the world. You should back up, I would remind you, on optical drives. Very safe source. Not magnetic imprinted. They're optical, right? So I'm going to cover both bases here, metaphysical and electronic, so everybody can be cool. You want to take this anywhere? You can go with it. Just keep rolling. Well, what do you want to hear? You're, you're, well, you're the great, you're the, you're the captain. Well, I'm let me like, ask you this. I'm like Sulu up front, dude. <laughs> well, okay. All right. Now, listen, what I want you to do at some point is, uh, you know, my email address is John B, J-O-H-N-B as in Bravo at coast -to -coast com. Send me an email so I can stay in touch with you. And uh, maybe we can explore this further at length because I want to get some other people on. But uh, I was looking at this um, must-see disclosure, new ancient Mayan artifacts found. It's a YouTube deal. And, you know, anybody can put anything on YouTube that they want. And, and some uh, of the presentations are better than others. Some of them are are total, um, what, what, would, what would we say, um, uh, bovine-based bio-effluent of vegetable fertilizer. However, some of them are, are, are spot on. So if, is it because the Mayans weren't all that interested in the technology, or if these drawings are to be believed in these carvings, did they have regular contact with the UFO guys and therefore didn't need to be technologically adept? They just needed to roll with the effect of the technology. Is he gone? I stick with the scholars because okay. it's not so much that they're not translating the dates accurately. They are doing a very good job with the dates. It's the fact of the matter that academic archaeologists and linguistic experts in, in Mayan glyph knowledge, if you will, they're not trained shamans for the most part. Do no, but I'm just saying? what I'm asking is, do you think there was some UFO uh, extraterrestrial crossover there that just said... Okay, these are the UFO guys. They've got the technology covered. We will just cover the things that we need to as a people and um, well, without this, this getting technical. Thing, we'll... thing, John, is that it's a slippery slope, dude, when, when you're looking at altered states of, of mind and truly masters of that and then talking about altered d dimensions and then talking about you know, these, these beings that exist in several dimensions. So when you look at the minds, you're talking about people who were communicating with other dimensions, and they had superfluous access with it. That's why they didn't care about technology. They had something that was literally better. Yeah, that's what I'm getting at. There's, there's no hardware that you're going to be able to call another dimension with. It's in your head. You have to master that. That's why these solar cycles are picking it up. They're saying, yeah, 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 you guys want faster broadband, you know, 4G, 5G, 6G. When is it going to be enough? When are you going to say, I'm going to turn within, because all of this stuff on the Internet it's not what I'm looking for. And the only way and only place you're going to find this is within 
your conscious, meditative, super deep trance states. That's all right, why all right. the military is interested in this stuff. We're coming up on a we're coming up on a break, so very quickly, and I do mean quickly. Okay. Tell us how do we tap into the inner self to be able to reach in and therefore perceive outward. Well, these sites that these pyramids are at are absolutely tuned to the energies. And it's not to say the energy of the whole system is not increasing, but this is where it's been harmonized. All right, this this is going to take longer than I thought. Marcus, you're a bright guy, but i got to bail on you, pal. I want you to send me that email. Don't forget to send it to me. We'll get you back on the show. I want to hear some more of your studies. This is Coast to Coast AM. We shall return with more of your calls. Please stand by. Will's in with you for the night. Uh, yeah, definitely take a look at these images, John Lear's images. The uh, They were provided to a company. Is, um, it's not really an appearance, is it? It's a presence on the program tonight. Hey, let's uh, let's take a couple more of your calls. How about Steve in Illinois on... Uh, He's, he's way east of the Rockies. Steve, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Um, your show has become a must-listen. I've been fighting the good fight for 32 years, so I know most of where I speak. Um, I would suggest to you, if you haven't already seen a documentary, uh, that you it's a must-see. It's called The Shock Doctrine. And I didn't think I could be entertained or moved, but it's 90 minutes of proper nomenclature events with an exact timeline, never boring. You will be talking about it, I would surmise, on your next show uh, next Saturday night. But um, it's called The Shock Doctrine. It's been on Shock Sunday. Doctrine. The and, Shock and that's a, Doctrine. What, is it on YouTube, or where is it? Well, uh, Sundance had it. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, I bought it. It's twenty bucks on your. Uh, you can get it off the uh, net, and that. But uh, John, uh, take it from me. It's something that you're going to have your jaw dropped. It will start out with Eisenhower's warning about the military-industrial complex, and you will go from "My God" to "Oh my God." It tells you exactly where we've been, where we're at. And where we're going, if we don't get these people stopped, I am so happy that you're having John Lear on. I don't know of whom you could find as a better guest than he, but there are people up there with him. But uh, he's excellent. And, um, you know, uh, uh, this fight started back with uh, Woodrow Wilson, and they literally caught him with his pants down. That's how they got the Fed started. And then... I, I'm not Democrat or Republican. I'm too smart for that for 26 years. Understood. Uh, you know, with Bill Clinton, I believe Monica Lewinsky was a plant so they could get the Glass-Steagall Act dropped. And it's been a race to the bottom from 1980 forward. I knew this uh, with the deregulation that came in and plus what they call taxpayer incentive to move big business out of this country. And I'm afraid uh, if you watch the shock doctrine, like I say, I think you'll uh, be ever happy. I mean, in some ways, but we got to get these people stopped, uh, John, or this country's gone. And I John is probably going to fill in a lot of it. And um, I want to thank you for being there. You're becoming a must listen. And there's people starting to gather because I run a business and I talk to a lot of people now. They're starting to listen to you. And please. Uh, Keep up with the good fight, and I thank you for your time. Well, thank you, Steve. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you for your kind compliments. Well, you reach a point in your life where you really kind of need to do something or you need to just um, become part of the landscape. And uh, I'm sure there are a few people out there that wish I would, but I'm not going to because you also reach that point in your life where you really just don't care. You've uh, spent a few decades observing this, and... You know, once these uh, once these conspiracy theories have been explored, and you have some solid evidence, they well they cease to be theories; they become conspiracies. And the fact is, is that the more people that are becoming aware of this, the more people are talking. They know we're talking. <clears throat> Excuse me. They're, they know we're talking. The NSA monitors everything. This has been going on for years. This is not new. It's just uh, now they're letting us know what before was somewhat secret. Now they're letting us know we're listening. Every text, every email, every phone conversation. 
all your website stuff. Even employers are starting to ask for your Internet history in furtherance of getting a J-O-B. And there's something wrong with this. So you know what I say? Keep pushing. Keep pushing. Keep revealing. Keep it going. Because all that's going to cause them to do is what? Show their hand even more. And then what? Then maybe the next time they bring something ludicrous in front of the Supreme Court, maybe maybe the next bunch that goes in there will get laughed at as well. How about Charles in L.A. on Wild 5? Is Charles in L.A. there? Yes, sir, I am. Good Thank evening. You. Welcome. Nice to be on. Um, I was wondering if you could maybe uh, uh, figure out how to get in touch with either Linda Moulton Howe or Joyce Riley and see if they can't get the veterans groups. I know Linda Moulton Howe has had a lot of experience with them. Get the veterans groups to uh, try and get rid of the Federal Reserve. Somebody has to, and I, I don't know... You know, who's going to do it? But uh, the Federal Reserve, the Council of Foreign Relations, uh, and the IMF uh, basically have been controlling this country for 98 years. And they have close to 500 people monitoring the news media coast to coast. That's why you don't uh, hear about UFOs and the things you really need to hear about. Well, it's undeniable at this point. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's funny. After being around the uh, around and in the news media for, for many years, you know, you find out pretty quick that, that the the whole story doesn't come from your station, doesn't co- all come from Channel One. We have the best news. Well, maybe you do and maybe you don't. But you get little pieces from all mm. the different channels, all the different sources, and then you put yourself together a picture, and, and there you have it. They but, think they're uh, very clever. You know, the Medal of Honor is the symbol of Satan. Oh, there you go. The I didn't know that. The pointed star, yeah. See, here's the thing, man. There, there are a lot of vets out there that are going to go, oh, man, Wells, if you let him get away with this, it's like you can just go to H E double L. But it's like, look, nothing, the, the thing is, is that I don't know that for a fact. Maybe, maybe you do, but I will tell you this. Nothing would surprise me. And, the, and these people who are running things, they're, they're pretty smart people. There's no doubt about it. Don't ever, don't ever get the idea they're stupid. Oh, no. Evil, evil is stupid, but uh, some of the perpetrators of it are pretty clever. Have you seen Inside Job? I have. Yeah. yeah. Also, they're bringing all our troops back back any of the well, if they survive they come back here you know they, they're firing all the weaponry over there with depleted uranium so all of our troops are getting poisoned and if they don't come back and uh you know commit suicide or do some dastardly deed like that one guy did apparently if he did killing 17 people over there uh, because they go crazy with that uranium poisoning a lot of them you know their diet's not that great in the service and well, and what did they send him back on a fourth tour for? I mean, weren't three enough for the man? Yeah, that's true, too. Also, Susan, uh, you had on about a month ago. Susan, Lindauer, yeah. Yeah. Can you have her? Are you going to have her on again? I, I bet think I will. She, I think she'd be good for about uh, three hours. She's great. That's what I'm thinking. I'll just sit back and have a proper cup of tea and let her talk. That would be great. And hey. you might ask uh, John Lear if, uh, if our, if our uh, ETs have... Uh, made a lot of the UFOs uh, of our government uh, inoperable. You, uh, people sometimes ask why uh, we don't land, they don't land on the Was- Washington lawn. It's because there's no sign of intelligent life there. Yeah, I'm with you. Well, thank you very <laughs> much for your call. Thank you very much. And, uh, okay, let's see. Well, we've got a couple of minutes here. We certainly do, maybe even longer than that. So how about, um, where's the man in Ontario? No, we talked to him already, didn't we? No. Yes, we did. Yes, yeah, of course. He had a Canadian accent. Of course he did. I was going, you sound like you're from Canada. I can't read my own writing. I should have been a doctor. What would have happened then? I probably would have forgotten and left a scalpel inside somebody. All right, how about, uh, is that Jeremy in Winslow, Arizona? West the Rockies? Leo in New Mexico. How about him? Uh, yes, uh, good evening, John. Pleasure to talk to you, sir. Good evening. I'm, I'm working on my penmanship here so I can read what I'm writing. <laughs> the typing's uh, even worse. I uh, just wanted to make the comment that uh, while I am fairly amazed at the uh, things that are that are occurring, for example, the passage of the NDAA and the, and the speed with which they are taking place, I'm not confused as to why these things are happening uh, personally. And, and the reason for that is that I can see that there is a global agenda at hand and not a national agenda. And I believe that anything... Um, passes that that uh, you know goes as an American 
agenda is uh, is just a smokescreen for the bigger yes. picture. And it's a piece of the puzzle designed to keep us all, uh, you know, placated while the national, while excuse me, while the global agenda is the one that's really being pursued. And I wanted to make the remark that um, in regard to all the ammunition, for example, that the government is covertly stocking and all of this, yep. I think that they may well have prior knowledge that 2012 either is or at least could be uh, the beginning of something cataclysmic of biblical proportions. And I, in my opinion, I think it's going to be something I'm in agreement with George Norrie that it will be either a solar event or mm-hmm. something on the order of a of a planet X with a with a very elliptical, highly elliptical orbit that only passes through very rarely through our solar system and throws everything haywire. You know, I'm thinking that, um, and and I'm just reaching. This is a this is a guess, and it's an unqualified guess, but it's. Um but it's my best guess. I'm thinking we're going to see weirdness uh, on a um, on a high level in August. It was a funny little canned radio show. It's it's really a great show. I think it's called Save Your Radio, and I heard this a couple of three years ago. But the host of the show did a dissertation on all those strange and ugly things that have happened and cataclysmic things that have happened during the month of August over the years. Mm-hmm. And um, it just seems like that that should be just enough time for a flashpoint. You know, there's there are enough people concerned about 2012 to cause something to happen, even if nothing was going to happen. I agree. Well, yeah. listen, thanks a lot for your call. I appreciate talking to you, and thanks for taking a moment and sharing with us some of your most valuable um, resource, which is your time. All right, let's see. What do we got here? Do we have uh, James on Wild 4 in Jackson, Mississippi? Yes. Hey, how are you tonight? Come on up and talk to us. Okay. My, my point is, and, and I got this from one of the shows, it, it occurred to me, you know, what, what is the force that causes the tide to rise and fall in the ocean? It's supposed to be the moon. It's gravitational okay. effect. Now, if you've got a force like that, they can pick up millions of tons of water, if you think about it. You know, why couldn't it pick up a few stones like, like you know, we're talking about Coral Castle or... You talk about the pyramids in Egypt or the stones in Peru. I mean, it, it occurred to me, I was listening to that about Coral Castle, and he did it at night when nobody could see, and it dawned on me, what well, do you got at night? You got the moon, and if you could figure out how to use that force of the moon, if it could pick up all that water, then surely it could pick up a few, a few rocks. That's no big deal. But how you do it, I don't know. But no, I don't I know either. If, if everybody listening, each person has got like a supercomputer on their sh- shoulders, if everybody's listening, think about it. Somebody could probably it'd be obvious. Well, they haven't figured out how gravity works, so <laughs> it may be a while before they figure this out. But, you know, like sun is free energy. The moon is free energy. So... We can figure out just how to use it to put it to work. I mean, that's well, that's the it. trick. You know, that's yeah. that's the whole trick. You know, I, I've felt for a long time that planet Earth is a place where you can do absolutely anything that you can think of. All you have to do is figure out how to do it. Yeah, I appreciate it's all around us. You know, yeah. you know. I appreciate one your other call. One other oh, go ahead. I didn't mean to chop you off. Go ahead and fin- finish your thought. The, the one other quick one was I did a quick advertisement for your your archives. Yeah. The, uh, the art, you, all the McDonald's around the country have free Wi-Fi. Yeah. And when I was in the club, what I do when I'm traveling across country is every time I stop at one of the McDonald's, I download a bunch of those shows on my, on my, the MP3s on my computer, and then you can listen to them while you're driving across the country. So... A little quickie for your show. Thank you very much, James. Thank. You. Take care now. You know, uh, apparently a lot of people have seen this uh, this documentary, and Dennis sent an email just now that said, uh, for your information, this documentary was made in '09, and it's available on uh, Netflix. So there you go. Check it out. All right, who who else do we have here? Do we have uh, who we got? I think we're uh, no, we got John in Hollywood. Yeah, John in Hollywood. Come on, John in Hollywood. What's going on out there? 
Oh, though your world wanders me, with your superior majestic cackling hen, your people I do not understand, so to you I say we shall put an end, that we will never hear surf music again. That sounds good to me. <laughs> Third stone from the sun, my friend. Mm -hmm. And you know, you know who we're talking about. Oh, yes. The sun refused to shine, I don't mind. So, the immortal Jimmy, you're talking about the immortal Jimmy. Yes, my man, the man, the man who had who had what I call super consciousness. The man that laid the law on the line, the man that said if the sun giveth, the sun taketh. Okay? So yeah. we are all ruled by the sun, John. All civilizations from the beginning of time have worshiped the sun. We all know that the sun is our uh, creator and destroyer. And that's the way it's going to be forever and ever. There's no changing that. So all these, and these two callers that you had before, I wanted to ask you, who's running this country? And then Look. the screener said, well, do, do I have an idea? Well, maybe I have an idea. And the caller that you had previously said that the military complex in this country is the most evil institution on this planet. And they are bent to nothing. And now they have a free ride to do whatever they want and and it doesn't matter anyway because even if they accomplish all their goals and their evil, Im, immoral uh, things that they that they want to do, John, uh, in the end they're doomed as well because this mothership is doomed. Any way you look at it, it doesn't matter. Okay, life and death are the only two forces in this universe that uh, the universe is constantly creating and destroying itself. Cause and effect is the only thing that is real. Okay. Well, so, it's also known as birth and death, you know what I mean? Yes, so why not, why not attain super enlightenment? Become enlightened, stop this nonsense, this greed, this stupidity, these, these, these jerks on Wall Street who can't, who like, you know, there's not enough money in the universe for these, for these idiots, okay? Don't say it, don't say it. John, I want you to stay in touch with the show. I always like it when you call. I'm going to take the, with the last call because we're running short on time, my brother, but stay well and uh, keep the... Uh, Keep the, the illumination of the immortal Jim I burning. Heather in Montana, let's close it out with the lady tonight. Thanks. Heather, Heather in Montana, are you there? Can you hear me, John? Uh, I can now. How are you tonight? I am very well. Excellent. How are you? Pretty good, thanks. Good. I hear we're short on time, so you are going to get John Lear on tonight. Yeah, yeah we're going to have John Lear on in just a minute. You've got about 30 seconds, so tell us what's on your mind. 30 seconds? Well, I just want to tell everybody, your planet is alive. I am here walking among you to, to walk a mile in your shoes and see what you're living with in real time. I am on the front lines with you all. And together, if you will not go to your places of power and neutralize the evil that is in authority over you, at least point at them and laugh. Excellent. It will mortify them. It will Excellent. mortify them when you have no more fear of them, when they know they can't control you anymore. That's beautiful, Heather. Thank you so much. John Lear is coming up next. Heather, that was, that was very nice. This is Coast to Coast AM. Strap in. All right. Stand by here in just about two minutes. Two minutes. The great John Lear will join us for an in-depth discussion of everything you ever wanted to know about aviation, some stuff about space, and none of it is normal. We like it like that on Coast to Coast AM. Well, John Lear, as you may know, is a retired airline captain, a former CIA pilot, as well as of, as the son of the famous inventor of the Lear jet. And I think the A-track -track tape player, and I heard the automatic direction finder for aircraft, but we'll get into that later. I may be wrong, but probably not. He's a Lockheed uh, L-1011 captain, and he is very highly regarded in aviation circles. He's flown over 150 test aircraft, not normal aircraft, test aircraft. He's won every award granted by the Federal Aviation Administration. He also holds 18 world speed records and has worked for 28 different aircraft corporations. During the late 1980s and early 1990s, John began coming forward with some startling revelations concerning the subject of aerial phenomena and those things known as UFOs.
Welcome onto the bridge, John Lear. It's been a long time. I've been listening to you and wanting to speak with you in person. Well, thank you, John. It's uh, nice to be here. Well, you know, you and I did not, uh, we didn't speak on the telephone before. Um, sometimes we, I do and sometimes I don't. And I just thought this would be a very interesting interview to just just kind of do it cold. We'll get to, we'll get to know each other in front of a few million of our friends. Absolutely. Um, John, you've had a remarkable career, just a remarkable history. And I'm curious, and this is probably intrusive, invasive, and indiscreet, but it's like, how is it that you're still on this side of the green with all the stuff that you know and all the stuff that you've done flying for the, uh, the CIA and everybody else? It, it seems like some of the, uh, some of the things you've uh, discovered and researched and then exposed to the public are um, borderline dangerous. I'm protected. Okay. Enough said. Well, I saw your affidavit that you had uh, that you'd submitted regarding the 9-11 thing. Do you mind if we touch on that for a, a couple of minutes? No, great. Uh, I'd like to get that sorted out. Well, here's the thing. Uh, my... Uh, take on on your affidavit was like it was totally impossible uh, that this this thing happened the way it's been told to the public at large from the um from the inability to get this the aircraft to that speed the inability to hit a target that's that size at that speed if you could get it to that speed and stuff like that now i understand that you're the uh are, are you are you the head of the um pilots for 911 truth no, I'm just a core member. Okay, and, gotcha. uh, you know what the uh, the problem with the uh, uh, the 911 uh, World Trade Center airplanes is we're talking about a, just a uh, normal uh, commercial pilot with not a great deal of experience tr- getting in a Boeing 767 cockpit uh, with the new EFA system, and uh, they were 90 miles away at 30,000 feet, and he's got to navigate back to New York. And then he's got to make this uh, perfect descent uh, to arrive at uh, the center of the World Trade Center, 208 feet wide, and uh, hit a dead center. It's just uh, it's just impossible. It's not uh, uh, almost impossible. It is impossible. <laughs> okay. I didn't see a lot of aircraft wreckage outside the Pentagon. No, the uh, Pentagon was a flyby, and... Uh, I suspect that um, Chick Burlingame was at the controls, and he was um, uh, uh, working with uh, Cheney on the exact <clears throat> on the exact uh, program of um, of a terrorist attack on the Pentagon. And the witnesses that they that pilots uh, for Truth have uh, saw the airplane come by the uh, the gas station, and then. Uh, some of them didn't see what happened to it after it, after that. None of them saw it crash into the Pentagon, and one of them saw it uh, uh, go over it and beyond. It probably went over and, and landed at Andrews Air Force Base, <clears throat> which is just a few miles beyond over the uh, Potomac. But there was no uh, wreckage there. Uh, April Gallup, who was sitting 40 feet from the where the uh, blast went off, she was sitting there. She's uh, Army Intelligence. And uh, she happened to have her six-month-old six son sitting below her desk in his car seat. Now, she had normally taken him to where they, you know, uh, take care of the kids when, when the moms go to work there at the Pentagon. But uh, they told her at the door, no, go ahead and take him on in. So uh, she had him there, and when the blast went off, uh, she saw no airplanes, no missiles, no drones, smelled no uh, gasoline. She did smell explosives, cordite. Uh, but uh, no kerosene, no jet fuel, <clears throat> no nothing like that. And she picked up her six-month-old son, put him on her shoulder, and crawled out that hole in the Pentagon and out to the grass where triage was taking place. And she eventually ended up in the hospital where our Army intelligence showed up later and uh, started uh, telling her that she saw a plane. And she said, no, I didn't see a plane. And she said, yes, he did. And she said, no, I didn't. And that's been an ongoing argument between her and Army Intelligence. She's been in a lot of, lot of problems since then. It's too bad she has to take the rap for this. And, and, what is, and what's her name? April Gallup. G-A-L-L-O-P. 
That's very interesting. Well, you can uh, Google her, and uh, she's a very interesting woman. I've seen a couple interviews that she's done, but no, there was no airplane that uh, went into the Pentagon, and uh, no bodies, no nothing like that. I and if there was, why wouldn't we? Of all the ha- all the 158 cameras around, why can't we just see one picture? Just show me one picture of a <clears throat> of a Boeing uh, 760 or 757 in that case um, <clears throat> making that descent and a perfect descent, and flying at one foot across the grass and uh, hitting the Pentagon. It did not happen. It's, it's ridiculous. It is ridiculous. And, and, in fact, a couple of congressmen have finally gotten with the uh, the program, and they're asking about the Saudi connection. Do you, uh, you have any insight on that? No, I don't. Um, I don't That's have what I like about a pilot. He'll just tell you if he doesn't know. Yeah. You know, there's nothing worse than trying to bluff your way through it. Well, now, I just did a little news story a while ago about these uh, increased radiation levels from the Fukushima uh, disaster over there. And, um, you know, of course, I was uh, I was supplied with some notes about some various things that we could talk about, and I wondered if you would like to begin there. Sure. People are uh, under the impression that there was a 9.0 earthquake over there that triggered the tsunami. And uh, if you look at any of the videotapes, you'll see that all of the... Um, uh, the uh, uh, high buildings, many store, multi-story buildings, are standing. All of the towers are standing. Anything with a spire is still standing. There was no 9.0 earthquake. What it was was an atomic bomb set off about 50 miles uh, to the north or to the northeast in the ocean to create the the tsunami. And the reason that was done is because uh, um, uh, Mossad had found out that. Uh, that um, the Japanese were secretly selling high-grade plutonium to Iran, and this was the payback. And uh, wow. Israel had just gotten the contract to uh, run the security for all 52 nuclear reactors there in Japan. <clears throat> and uh, what they did is, after they set off the uh, atomic bomb, they uh, set all the controls so that none of the emergency systems would work. And so that put uh, Japan in a in a real problem. And, you know, who knows how far reaching that problem is. Well, as long as we're talking about Iran, the, is it your opinion that we're going to go forward with the conflict with them? You know, I don't know, but there's one interesting thing that not many people know about. We have built, the Navy has built, uh, a couple of um, uh, destroyers, or battleships, I mean, uh, that are completely remote controlled. There's not one single person on them. What they do is they, uh, for all these uh, um, computers and controls that uh, run the battleship, uh, there's a place on the back, a fantail, where a helicopter can land, and there's nine um, computer programmers that uh, can land a helicopter and go and fix anything that goes wrong. And then they take off, and then this thing can go anywhere uh, guided by satellites, and uh, you know what I would think that we'd use it for is to sail it out in through the Straits of Hormuz and provoke an attack uh, where Iran uh, bombs it, and then we say, "Oh, all our poor Americans are dead. Six hundred uh, Americans are dead. We're going to retaliate," you know. And then you know, where in fact nobody's dead. It was just a, a remote control battleship, and that would you know provoke the the fight. Now, whether that's going to happen or not, I don't know, but. That uh, battleship is certainly uh, uh, in production, and they made three or four of them. Um, lit and Ingalls, I guess, again, maybe. Um, remote control. So bouncing back to 9-11 here, do you think those aircraft were remote control? Because, I mean, uh, there seems to have been a, um, a noticeable absence of any people who were related to any of the passengers that may or may not have been on that, those aircraft. Yeah, there's a couple books out. One is called uh, uh, No Passengers on 9-11, and it uh, <clears throat> talks about uh, trying to find any evidence of uh, through uh, driver's licenses and the Social Security, Social Security Index uh, and uh, passports of uh, the passengers that were on there. And they're only able to account for a very low, low percentage of the passengers that are alleged to have been on those airplanes. Now, in the case of Flight 93, uh, we know that la- that landed in Cleveland, and we know that uh, the pl- passengers deplaned and went into the NASA hangar there, and then that airplane took off. We know that uh, Flight 11, uh, American Flight 11, and American Flight 77 
uh, never departed anywhere, according to the Bureau of Transportation Statistics. There's no, there's no record of them ever taking off. <clears throat> so that just leaves 93 and uh, 175 to have possibly uh, uh, done anything or, uh, you know, taken off and uh, gone someplace. But there were, certain no, there were certainly no airplanes involved uh, in any crashes. Uh, World, uh, uh, World Trade Center 1 and 2, we've talked about that. No wreckage of any kind. <clears throat> and then Shanksville. Of course, what happened here is the interesting thing that happened here is there were supposed to be uh, four simulated crashes, and uh, <clears throat> Flight 93 was the one that was supposed to uh, crash into Building Number 7. But something went wrong between 10.30 and 11 o'clock that prevented them from simulating either by video fakery or by holograms of this airplane crashing into the world, uh, into the uh, building number seven, and they had to fake it going somewhere else. So in the six hours between 11 o'clock and 5 a and 5 p.m., when is when they let the reporters into uh, Shanksville, they had to hurry up with a uh, fake um, a crash scene, and they got this little um, ditch there about uh, 40 feet long, and they had a uh, backhoe there, and they had uh, men standing around in the hazmat suits, but that's all there was. There was no wreckage. I think I saw one <clears throat> little, it could have been either a brake or a, a turbine, uh, but that was in the bucket of the <clears throat> of the backhoe, and we never saw how it got there. We didn't see him dig it out of the ground. It just, uh, the camera panned down, over, and it showed it while it was in the bucket. So there's no possibility an airplane the size of a Boeing seven uh, a Boeing um, uh, seven fifty seven could have gone into uh, and crashed in that place at Shanksville. Absolutely not. Uh, there would be some wreckage, either tail. You know that's why they put the flight recorder and the um, <clears throat> and the uh, cockpit voice recorder in the tails because that always survives the accident. But as far as disappearing into the ground, didn't happen. Could not happen. You know, it's interesting. You would think that um, there'd be a wall with all these people's names on it somewhere. Yeah, but there is. Yeah, a well, it'd be uh, be too too uh, tough. Some some people might start trying to find out. Uh, you know, uh, make uh, find out the uh, identity and the uh, provenance of these each and every one where they work. You know, driver's license number, social security number, whether or not they applied for. Um, the uh, disaster uh, relief, the social security, social security index. Um, so they wouldn't, uh, they have, you know, done uh, nothing as far as providing uh, that information. It, it was a mess up. They, uh, they didn't plan it uh, fully. And whoever they are, uh, there had to be a small group because they didn't want any leaks. But this small group didn't apparently have the brains uh, to carry this off and to plan it so that nobody would figure it out. Well, it's interesting, like in the case of Building 7, first you say in, in, in one video you see a little penthouse, just a smaller building on top. Yeah. And then another one, you don't see it, it's gone. And That's the thing, interesting, I didn't notice that. I'm going to look at that next time. Uh, it's, it's, it's really kind of obvious. Uh, NIST's version is uh, there's, there's no little, it's, it's just a small little penthouse. It's almost like a utility building on the roof, and you can see it there. Well, because of the way the thing imploded, it went down first. So they just picked up <laughs> their video after it had disappeared from view and then went, okay, here it is coming down. It's just like, wow. When you see both videos, I mean, it's just undeniable. I, I've been around video production people for a long time, and I can spot fake video pretty yeah, easily. Well, ni Flight 93 was supposed to, uh, uh, they were supposed to fake the, uh, the crash into Building 7, and uh, when something went wrong that they could not fake it, they just had to make that um, uh, the fake crash at Shanksville, and then they were left with buildings, uh, you know, all ready to explode at, uh, at uh, you know, it was ready to go, and they were ready to uh, implode it, and, you know, the guys were standing around saying, what are we going to do? The, the public will never buy this, you know, and then one of the guys said, uh, the public will buy anything we tell them, so just, just light it off, you know, just just have that thing disappear. Um, they'll, they'll believe anything we tell them. That's pretty much true, I suppose, isn't it? Because they, uh, it they is who has a the great deal. Uh, What's not that? For me, but uh, for a lot of the people. 
What about the? I don't, I don't want to just beat this horse until it's glue, but it's like hey, the, beat it. I'm ready right here. You know, hand me the. Well, they have a passenger manifest on these flights. What happened to that? Well, yes, uh, the captain uh, signs the weight and balance and passenger manifest, and he passes that out the door as the last thing that happens, because what they want is a record of the fuel on board, the weight and balance, and the passengers in case anything happens to that airplane, and it's called the envelope. Uh, and after he signs that, the last thing that happens is the captain passes it to the uh, head flight attendant, and he or she passes it out the door, and then they close the door. And uh, that's how it works. But none of those flight envelopes <clears throat> have ever showed up. Okay. Well, I don't know what to, I don't even know what to say at this point. I mean, we all, <laughs> you know, it's like a, what, what do you say when the evidence is so irrefutable? It's the, it just doesn't. It just doesn't add up. Right. I mean, well. not. I mean, you're not associated with this, but let's just uh, go back to some you may not be entirely familiar with that that Waco thing that happened when all of a sudden all these federal troops start shooting at the this this church down in Waco, Texas. Right. There are a couple of things that come to mind here. I didn't see any dirt spouts or bullet holes on the police cars or anything. I just saw all these agents and policemen out there just wailing with their automatics, just dumping their mags, and I'm going, okay, I don't see anybody shooting back. <clears throat> and then you see these SWAT guys on the roof. And one of them goes in, and then there's sort of this this this, uh, this 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 chubby boy in a SWAT uniform is yanking on the curtain, and then he kind of looks like he sprays his sub in behind the guys that just went in, and there's this cut. And the next thing you see is stuff flying through the wall from inside to outside. That's exactly now they're on the second floor, right? Yeah. And I, and I'm seeing this TV station I used to work for at that time, and says live down in the bottom right corner, and yet there's edits in this there are edits in this this video. Exactly. So now the stuff comes through the wall, and the guy slides down the ladder. Well, later on, a, a lot of people, a lot of people, I'm happy to say, it's not just me, saw these videotapes that were going around that were not edited. And what you see is it appears that this guy threw something in the window behind them, which that would be fragments from what he threw in there coming out through the wall. My next question is, now wait a minute. If this is a local television station videotaping this, how do they happen to be that close, and how is it that they got that camera up to the second floor level, you know, and framing these people going through the window in it? It's just like exactly, yeah. exactly. I mean, was this like some? Was this like they borrowed the Hubble telescope or something for the day? <laughs> I don't yeah. get it. I really don't. But then again, as time goes by, Ms. Uh, Captain Lear, I, I, I do get it. Okay, so an A bomb. <clears throat> was used to pay back Japan again. There was a funny photograph. This little temple was there. Showed yeah. the, uh, I think it was Nagasaki, and it's yeah. standing yeah. there. Yeah, yeah. And then the next thing is you see all this scorched earth around it standing there. You seen the one I'm talking about? And then, yeah, then you see it again absolutely. after the tsunami, and it says, my question is, what is this thing made out of? Yeah. Yeah. All right, John Lear is with us tonight. I am delighted to report, and we shall return with him and his very, very singular experiences. And, oh, man, how deep is it? We need waiters that come up to our armpits. See if we can get some of those. Special order, only for Coast listeners. This is Coast to Coast AM. I just can't let it go. A low-time commercial pilot hits a building 208 feet wide, dead center at 560 miles an hour in a plane he's never flown before. That does seem just a little fast for a commercial airliner to go that speed. John Lear says it's not possible. And actually, there were two planes, not just the one that hit the World Trade Center right in the center of the building, and there were a couple of offices, very special offices in those buildings that those uh, aircraft landed. They were aircraft, maybe not airliners, but they were certainly aircraft. We're going to talk to him about everything. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll stick to the terrestrial subjects first. But there's so much to discuss with John Lear tonight. Underground U.S. Navy submarine base in Nevada. Civilization on the moon. But before we get to that, I want to talk about TWA 800, and we will do that. Back in two minutes. This is Coast. John Lear, it's good to have you with us tonight. Um... Let's go back just a little bit because we've we've got some uh, we've got some time here, and rather than just um, rather than just sort of putting you out on the clothesline by 
you know, talking about these things that are difficult to believe. Yeah. I just want to amplify a couple of things, and in, just in the interest of uh, of credibility, because I see your track record. There's 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 no way that a man with your credentials is just going to pull stuff like this just out of his hat. Yeah. Notice I use the word hat. <laughs> so, so, so here's the thing. Let's go back to this thing with Japan. Are you asking me to believe that a nuclear bomb went off in the ocean as payback? I mean, is that is such a thing even possible? Yeah. That is such an enormous atrocity. I have no doubt that there are some uh, evil uh, little goblin kings and maybe even some queens out there that would do such a thing. But what what suggested to you that that's, that this thing actually it, it was a real event? Uh, the guy that wrote the whole uh, scenario, he was there. He knew all of it that was going on, <clears throat> and I forget his his name, but he used to still be on the uh, uh, the web and outlined all of this in incredible detail uh, what happened. And uh, my only you know question, if you don't believe it, just tell me where the nine point zero earthquake was. There was none. All the uh, buildings are still standing. The only damage that was done was by the uh, the tsunami that was created by the uh, atomic weapon. And this was payback because Japan was providing Iran with uh, nuclear material? Um, yes, uh, high-grade plutonium for their uh, reactor. Okay. I wonder if they've got a fire set yet. A fire set? Yeah, some little to, once they make the bomb to actually let it off, you know. Yeah, triggers and so forth. I wonder. And uh, then going back to the remote control battleship, and then bouncing from that over back to nine eleven. Do you think these were remote control aircraft that uh, that did the deed in New York City? No, there was no aircraft. What were they? What was what? The, the oh, aircraft the, uh, that did how the did buildings. They do it? Yeah. Oh, those those buildings were uh, <clears throat> were. Um, uh, disintegrated. Mole- uh, the uh, weapons used were uh, using uh, molecular uh, dissociation, and what it is is a weapon fired from space <clears throat> that um, uh, uh, devolves or uh, takes steel and concrete to its uh, elemental uh, form, its molecular form, Dis- disintegrates everything, and that's why there was so much dust around Manhattan, three inches of dust. All that was the steel and concrete uh, that was uh, being molecular uh, uh, disassociated. <clears throat> and as you saw the first pictures uh, uh, after the collapse, there's maybe uh, one story, maybe one and a half stories of uh, debris. Uh, if it had been a conventional explosion, if it had been a nuclear bomb or, or um, uh, you know, some kind of conventional explosion, there would have been at least 15 stories of uh, of uh, wreckage there, uh, building materials. But there was nothing left. Uh, there was only dust, uh, which got uh, uh, tinier and tinier. As a matter of fact, now it's 10 years later, and uh, what happened is they didn't know, whoever they are, the power of the weapon they were using. And the problem was they found out uh, that it was um, self-generating. And after they had uh, eliminated everything, the process kept going on so that uh, every time they tried to elect, uh, erect a steel or concrete building on that same spot, uh, that it would uh, uh, turn to rust and, um, and uh, start to disintegrate. So what you see there in the place of um, the World Trade Centers where they were is pools. And uh, they've got water there, and they're building around it, but they're not building on top of it because they can't. Um, because that, that process of what they unleashed uh, is still going on. Well, then what did we see? If the aircraft did not hit the building, what, what's the deal with the videotapes and so forth? You saw the buildings imploding from the top, and as it fell, it disintegrated. Nothing got to the ground. Well, I mean, what about the airplane? Oh, what well, about the airplane? That was video fakery. <clears throat> that was uh, uh, video inserted by the uh, A. Uh, what do they call that? Uh, e four, 
the uh, doomsday airplane. They can insert uh, video into any television station they want at any time they want. Um, in uh, several of the uh, television stations, they inserted that video. It didn't always work correctly, but uh, that's what it was supposed to, uh, uh, to look like. Now, I've said that there's a possibility that they used holography, and uh, the technology is there. has been there for 20 years to use holograms, moving holograms that have, uh, <clears throat> that have light, uh, sound, um, and, uh, and you can see them on broad daylight. I mean, it, you don't need a screen or anything. You can project it into thin air. <clears throat> and I thought that that might have been used, and I still reserve that possibility. But uh, basically, it was some kind of video fakery that uh, the public was shown of, those, uh, of the, the only airplane that we saw um, that uh, went into, uh, well, let's see, building number, the uh, South Tower. That was uh, United Airlines 175. Well, this is unbelievable to me. It's just, uh, I, don't, I don't, I feel a little subdued, uh, actually, because uh, if this is true, then, well, I suspect we're in deeper stuff than we think we are, and most of us perceive that it's pretty deep already. Well, there's a book out called uh, Where Did the Towers Go, written by Dr. Judy Wood. And if you can get a hold of that book, it's uh, about 600 pages. Uh, it's very, very detailed. It tells you exactly what I'm telling you, but uh, in more detail. It has pictures, graphs, four-color uh, pictures and graphs, uh, and it tells you uh, exactly what happened, uh, And uh, except that it doesn't make a... Uh, um, a decision on whether it was from space or, or where it was. She doesn't say it was a, a space-borne um, weapon. She will not say it because she doesn't know. And uh, But she tells you the exact method of what they used, and they used part of uh, the energy to uh, create this... Uh, <clears throat> to create this uh, um, force that disintegrated the buildings using... Um, Hurricane Aaron, and Hurricane Aaron had been carefully uh, put together by uh, HARP and uh, by other processes, and it was uh, driven up the East Coast. It took six days, and on the this, on this sixth day, it was right there, 100 miles off the coast of New York, and they were able to use somehow the energy in that uh, hurricane to pull off what they did. And then, of course, after this, the hurricane marched off into the, uh, into the northeast. What's interesting is on the radio programs or the TV programs that morning, there was absolutely no mention of a hurricane bigger than uh, Katrina 100 miles off the coast of New York. But if you get this book, it's called Where Did the Towers Go? Um, Judy, Dr. Judy Wood lays it out, you know, perfectly. Anybody that I know that's read the book said, my God, that that uh, lays it out. That's it. Uh, uh, John, uh, tell us some things about HARP. Everybody talks about it, but nobody's really... Uh, you know, I don't know that. a lot about it, but they can control the uh, atmosphere. They control the weather. Uh, the Russians have the same type of stuff, and they, and they can do the same thing. Um, what they uh, can do, basically, in controlling the weather, they can create hurricanes. They created Katrina, and you can see the uh, radar um, recordings of that uh, Katrina marching up towards the north in a straight line, uh, dead towards uh, New Orleans, and just splitting off to the, uh, veering just a little bit off to the right as it got to uh, New Orleans and created all that havoc. But that... Uh, that was somebody controlling that. They built the hurricane, and they moved it, and they put it where they wanted. Same thing they did with uh, with Aaron. And the Oklahoma City uh, was a prelude to 9-11. The same damage that was created in the Mira building is uh, what we see in... Um, in the World Trade Centers uh, 1 and 2 and the, and the other buildings around uh, World Trade Centers 1 and 2. Uh, you'll remember in the Mira building, they found explosives wrapped around the, uh, <clears throat> the columns that did not go off. 
And, uh, and I don't know what they were there for. I guess they were supposed to go off. But uh, that was uh, molecular disassociation, uh, but just a very, very uh, little portion of it. They didn't use it at full blast like they did uh, on uh, 9-11. But if you take a picture, as a matter of fact, uh, Dr. Woods shows that in her book. She takes a picture <clears throat> of the Mira building and puts it right uh, next to a picture from uh, 9-11, and the damage is identical. This is remarkable. All right, let me ask you this then. What about TWA 800? Well, TWA 800 uh, happened years ago, and it was the uh, uh, one of five airplanes that the U.S. Navy has been able to shoot down accidentally. The first was a TWA Constellation uh, full of... Um, Troops going to Vietnam in 1963, uh, it was uh, uh, a Flying Tiger airplane. I worked for the Flying Tigers, about, went to work for them about a year after that, and uh, I knew a lot of the inside stories on that. But what happened is they were on their way to Vietnam, and they were over Guam. And one of the Navy fighters um, went up and was just doing some practice um, air-to-air combat, with this TWA constellation, and one of the missiles got away from him and uh, shot it down. And then, of course, the other one is the Iranian uh, airline in the uh, Persian Gulf uh, that they shot down. And then what happened at uh, TWA 800 is they had a a submarine that was um, uh, practicing shooting down a drone, and that drone was uh, on the same direction and path as TWA uh, 800, and for whatever unexplainable reason, uh, the radar tracking broke track for a couple of milliseconds. And when it re uh, re uh, assembled the track, uh, reacquired the track, it reacquired TWA 800. And the missile, which was uh, not armed, it was just a um, um, <clears throat> an armed missile, went through the uh, from the first class. I think it was row. Um, 23 to 24 in first class uh, through to the other side of the fuselage and uh, blew it up. And, of course, they had SEAL teams there within 30 minutes uh, getting every kind of possible damage that would uh, implicate the Navy. Uh, the Navy, of course, turned around, headed for parts unknown. And, you know, people say, oh, no, that couldn't happen because, uh, you know, the Navy, the, all those swabbies, they, uh, they talk, you can't shut them up. Well, that's not true. The Navy is a very... Uh, tight-lipped uh, uh, organization, and uh, those guys aren't going to say anything, uh, no matter what they witness. But what they do is they split them up, and they send every different person that was on that uh, submarine to a different uh, place so that they cannot communicate or coordinate. Uh, but that's essentially what happened there. And uh, what the government did to help uh, cover it up, and that was uh, Richard uh, Clark's deal, they went to Boeing and they said, uh, we want you to say uh, that uh, the center tank fuel was, uh, there was a, a um, electrical arc which lit off the center tank fuel and uh, blew it up. And Boeing said, no, no we're not going to do that because, first of all, it's not, it can't possibly happen. There are no wires in the center tank. It's a closed uh, pump. There are no wires that go anywhere near uh, or being exposed to fuel. It cannot happen. And they said, uh, they came back a couple of weeks later, and they said, well, I'll tell you what, if you'll say that it was the center tank fuel pump, exposed wires, uh, blew up, and it was only uh, on, T, on uh, Boeing 747s, 100s, which, of course, uh, Boeing no longer produced. They said, right. only on 100s, we'll let you uh, merge with McDonnell Douglas. And, of course, Boeing had been trying to merge with McDonnell Douglas for six years, but they were tired up in the uh, antitrust legislation, and, uh, and they just couldn't get it through the courts. So at that point, Boeing said, yeah, yeah, we'll do that. If it's only if only the hundreds, and then only the one hundreds, and then uh, uh, you'll let us uh, merge with um, uh, McDonnell Douglas, and then they yeah, went so to the TWA, and they said, and of course TWA knew the real story uh, about the submarine, so they told TWA, if you'll keep your mouth shut, we'll give you a hundred a three hundred and sixty eight million dollar loan uh, that doesn't have to be paid back, and um, that was the uh, the payoff to TWA to keep their mouth shut. And the only persons that, that lost in all this were the passengers. They got nothing. 
What about? Uh, let me ask you this, uh, and then we'll we'll move on to to uh, some other stuff that's probably equally traumatic. What about that one that that Airbus that went down over Rockaway Park right after a nine eleven? That was a bomb in the uh, left uh, aft cargo compartment. And that's on several videotapes and the uh, cameras that are around there. But what they couldn't have is a uh, terrorist attack a couple of months right after 9-11. And after we'd made the, uh, you know, the threats that nobody will ever do that to us again, and we're going to do this and we're going to do that, and, and boom, it happens again right there in, in LaGuardia. And uh, so they couldn't afford that to happen. So they came up with this BS story about uh, <clears throat> about the co-pilot uh, using too much rudder to counteract the uh, uh, the wing uh, vortices turbulence and awake turbulence. And, yeah, I heard uh, that story too. You're supposed to and, start slamming the rudder pedals back yeah, and forth to make it straighten and, out or some nonsense. And tore the wing off, and of course that I mean tore the uh, vertical uh, the vertical tail off. But of course that's that's BS. That that didn't that didn't happen. What they what they had to do was promise uh, the French something to make the French keep their mouths shut, and I don't know what that is. I'll pro- we'll probably find out someday what it was, but uh, I don't know that now. But yeah, that was the bomb, and it was in the uh, left, or excuse me, the right aft uh, cargo compartment. John, I'm tempted to almost wax juvenile here as uh, we come up to the uh, top of the hour, and that is, you know, you see these old uh, these these uh, films that were taken back in World War II, and uh, you see a Marine out there just just letting off with one of those uh, those Browning nineteen nineteens, just chopping up people like I mean they don't even look like people, just chunks coming off of people. So I mean I know these things happen, but philosophically speaking, I mean if there's even any room for that left in this reality anymore, what? <sighs> What is going on here? I understand that governments, kings, queens, parliaments, whatevers, have have done horrible, ghastly, evil things that when you behold their works, you go, oh, this is truly ghastly. But this seems just a little bit over the top to me. I mean, how how deep is our... How bad is is the world right now, John? (laughs) Well, fortunately, John, you and I don't have to worry about it because the reason we're here on Earth is to um, mature our souls. And the people that made us, made humankind, put us here in this kind of prison planet so that we uh, go through all these uh, experiences and learn how to try and live with integrity and without envy, hate, or greed. And uh, ours is not to worry about all this or try and rectify it. It's to live our own lives and to improve ourselves. Uh, not always say, well, we got to stop this guy from doing that and that guy from doing that. What we're worried about is uh, maturing our own selves. And uh, when we finish with this uh, tour, uh, we go up to um, a fantastic place where they review all the good things and the bad things we did in our lives. <clears throat> and if we haven't learned to live with integrity and without envy, hate, or greed, it's uh, boom, back down to earth for another tour. Uh, if we did make the grade... Then we go out to go in this wonderful, fantastic, um, limitless uh, universe that's around us. Unbelievable, fantastic things that uh, that are ours for the uh, the taking. As soon as we learn how to live with integrity and without envy, hate, or greed. Excellent. So in the end, it appears that it really is all about love. Well, we're going to carry on with our most singular discussion with the one, the only. John Lear, on the one and only Coast to Coast AM. Well, you know what? We're hearing a lot of stuff tonight from John Lear, and uh, some of it is just borderline unbelievable. But um, but he has the bona fides, that, um, the bona fides, the bona fides, the experience. So I'm listening, and I'm glad that you're listening. And we're going to hear some more from John about... Um, some stuff that we've taken for granted as being true, but just might not be the way it was presented to us, don't you think? Two minutes, please. Stay cinched down, as don't you know. Ah, John Lear. So, <laughs> That's some, your service. Of the, some of the people out here just can't believe it. Just can't <laughs> believe this stuff. That's okay. That's okay. It's uh, pretty startling information, but... 
Yeah, yeah it really is. Now, somebody made mention of, of some uh, New York City fireman or something out there on 9-11, keeping people away from a motor, the, an engine, a, the, a jet engine that was lying out there in the street. That doesn't necessarily mean anything, though. No, that engine was um, from a different airplane. That was the... Uh, <clears throat> That was the CJ CF six, which is a General Electric air uh, General Electric uh, engine, and they're off um, um, the American Airlines airplanes. That engine would have come from 